They were in all kinds of ways. Testing. Oh, you I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to the College of Complexes on our infamous election debate night. My name is Tim. I'm going to be moderating until the question and answer period starts where Brom will be taking over. We have two speakers tonight for the Romney campaign and for the Obama campaign. Will you please, uh, I'm forgiving the names of our debaters tonight, so I look like crazy. But uh, if you'll come on up real quick and introduce yourselves, well, uh, our two debaters come on up. All right. Michael Brennan for the Democrats and Raj Patel for the Republicans. Ooh. We, we've established yeah. that uh, We've established the fact that Raj will be going first, but before we start taking over, there's a couple of rules around. There's a couple of rules that we must be familiar with around the college. One is one pool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. In, in lieu of uh, our things, we're going to have the college. It's going to be a little bit of a different format. We're going to do announcements, then we're going to do two 10-minute rounds of debate, followed by a second 10-minute round of debate. Then we're going to go into uh, Q&A from the audience, followed by two-minute summary of each political view. Then we go into our infamous round of rebuttals, followed by if they have any closing statements at the end of the night. Is anybody clear or has any questions on the debating rounds at this time? Just to review the rules of debate, it's going to be two rounds, ten minutes each. Mr. Barnes will start, followed by... Uh, Mr. No, Patel, Brennan. No, Brennan, I'm sorry. Patel. Is it Brennan and Patel? Brennan Patel, Mr. Brennan and then Mr. Patel. <laughs> I thought it was the other way around. Okay. No. no. <laughs> We're starting off 10 minutes with Mr. Brennan, 10 minutes with Mr. Patel, followed by a follow-up with two 10-minute rounds of debate each. I've debated both presenters on the timing rules, and that's, if you're ready, let's welcome Mr. Michael Brennan for Barack Obama. Thank you, it's good to be back. In this election, we have an important choice. Are we going to move toward health care for all of us that's affordable? Or are we going to move toward prosperity? Are we going to be safer from the environmental pollution? Are we going to be kept from being entangled in wars like Iraq, wars that we don't have to fight? First, let's look at Medicare. This is a program that's so efficient, so popular, so effective for everybody, that if it covered everybody, we would finally do what other countries are doing, treating health care like a human right. But there's a big difference between the two candidates. First, a little review of, of how important Medicare is. A little statement from Burl Clemens of Chicago. She said, I broke my hip and shoulder. I had a heart attack. Without Medicare, I wouldn't have been able to get any health care. I wouldn't have been able to afford the private health insurance premiums. I would have been dead. But Mitt Romney wants to exchange the guaranteed coverage, the efficient coverage of Medicare, where 98% or such of our health dollars go into the health care. He wants to exchange that for a system in which people would get private health insurance vouchers. And that voucher supposedly would cover you. But private health insurance has two severe disadvantages. One, it's way too expensive, and two, it's unreliable. The expenses of private health insurance are summarized in this statement from the General Accounting Office that was made many years ago, but still is probably largely true. They said that if we got rid of all those expenses from private health insurance, and put us all into a Medicare for all sort of system, we would save so much money that we could cover everybody for what we're spending now. Everybody. Here's an example of what 
goes in, uh, what goes into the private health insurance company. Maybe you saw this article in the Tribune about six years ago. This is about the chief executive officer. His base salary was $2,300,000 a year, and he cleared more than $100 million that he cashed in stock options. And when he was departing, his yearly departing salary was going to be $5,100,000 for the rest of his life. He also had stock options that were worth $1,780,000,000. So Mitt Romney wants to put us into a system where we're, we'd be choosing some of these private health insurance companies. That's where our money would be going. As far as reliability of getting into that system, let me read you a little bit from the testimony of Dr. Linda Pino. She testified before Congress that she caused the death of a man. He needed a heart transplant. She said this, once I stamped deny across his authorization form, his life's end was as certain as if I had pulled the plug on a ventilator. And I was rewarded for this. I exemplified the good company doctor. I saved half a million dollars. You know, getting, having a big, big illness when you've got a health insurance company, it's a little bit like jumping out of a plane with your parachute is your health insurance company. How many of you would want to jump out of a plane if the chances are one in four that you couldn't open your parachute or you had trouble opening your parachute? That is an estimate based on the Consumer Report study of thousands of people having health insurance through private health insurance. In the top third of HMOs, people with serious illness had 25% of them, one in four, had trouble getting the health care they needed. One in four. So this is the system that Governor Romney would put us into. Let's go on to another big difference between the two candidates, and that is the economy. I know it's, uh, it's very bad and nobody has all the answers, but a couple of Harvard economists looked at economies like ours and they said this. They said that, you know, when the banks are, have this kind of a mess, it takes a long time to get out of it. And they said, let me quote, that they noted that the United States performance is better than average. Thank you. This is my wonderful wife, Arlene, helping me out with this. Harvard economists. Now we're going on to some great new news for a lot of us. There's a new book out, I hope you've seen it, by a Time correspondent who has won awards for his work called The New New Deal. And this man has brought out some very under-publicized information about what the Obama administration has actually done. You, you, listening to the debate, you'd think they hadn't done anything. But really, they have. And their poverty program, here's, I'm reading from a synopsis of the book. It says, it helped prevent a, a depression while jump-starting the president's agenda for lasting change. It included, includes the largest expansion of anti-poverty programs since the Great Society, lifting millions of Americans above the poverty line, reducing homelessness, modernizing unemployment insurance. That's part of the record. We don't hear too much about that, not even from the Obama administration, because obviously the work is not finished. Now what about the, the Romney alternative? We're well aware of Bain Capital, and Bain Capital exports jobs overseas, as you probably have heard. And Bain Capital, Governor Romney said, well, he made 100,000 jobs with them. When someone asked Bain Capital about this, they said, we don't keep track of the jobs. So where did he ever come up with this figure? Maybe you've been wondering where he's come up with some of his other figures if you've been looking at Fact Checker. 100,000 jobs, he said. Where's the record? Also, let's look at his record as governor of Massachusetts. Low job creation. 
He took his eye off the ball, as one specialist said. Even some of Romney's most loyal supporters frown when the subject of job creation comes up. The state ranked near the bottom in the nation in job creation. And as far as the prosperity there, the, the median income under Romney, adjusted for inflation, went down $539 during his term. And this is the man that he wants, this is the man that says we should trust him, he's going to get us out of this. Let's listen instead to what Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz said about the Romney proposals. He said, the Romney plan is going to slow down the economy, worsen the jobs deficit, and significantly increase the likelihood of a recession. In contrast, President Barack Obama recognizes the need to stimulate the economy. As far as Romney's proposals, you know, you've heard about these 15 or 12 million jobs you keep hearing about. Well, according to Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, that's a lie. And if you want to go to the Washington Post, they do the, the fact checking there. They give Pinocchio awards for, uh, uh, for lies. They give four Pinocchios, four Pinocchios for Romney's claim about 15 million jobs. Four Pinocchios. So what about our environment? How about breathing in toxic pollution? The legal conservation voters have endorsed President Romney. They point out, for example, this. President, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Thanks for correcting me. President Obama. My dear wife, is Arlene's going to help me keep on track on this. All right. They point out that he has worked to, excuse me, I'm on the wrong page. minutes. Oh, I forgot to say, one other, other problem with the Romney case is he wants to make it easier for corporations to go to other countries with low taxes. That is estimated to cost America, or at least would increase the jobs in other countries by 800,000 jobs. The great job creator has struck again. All right, then we have another question about the environment. It said, uh, legal conservation voters say, President Obama has made great strides toward building a clean energy economy. He is implemented the first ever national standards to limit mercury and other toxic air pollution from power plants, which will save lives and reduce asthma attacks. Okay, and the scariest part of all is that, remember President Obama in Federal Plaza, I oppose the war in Iraq. Romney, twice at least I support going into Iraq and I oppose twice he said that he said in 2008 he even said I support it and he even his excuse was he said the, that Saddam wouldn't let us in to inspect but we were in inspecting if he doesn't know something that important that we had our inspectors in there from the UN and he doesn't know that I mean what other things does he not know about foreign policy that is scary so I please consider Consider the danger of electing a man like that. Thank you. Your time is up. Mr. Patel, are you ready to go? Ten minutes for Mr. Patel. Amen. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, You can give in now if you want. Okay. Oh, come Every, on. Everything you said and talked about is discussed all over internet and TV and cable and everywhere. First I want to say that Prime Minister uh, conveys his greetings and ask you to vote for Romney. That is Prime Minister of Israel. So those who love him Please do his bidding. Uh, I'm a registered Democrat and I supported Clinton, Lyndon Ben Johnson for a reason. 
those people, they achieved things, they talked to people, they discussed the issues, they fought for it, and that is what Obama is not doing. Okay. I'm, I'm a Romney, sir. I'm not a Romney surrogate. I'm not affiliated with Romney campaign. And uh, I support Romney because I think he will be the best president. The, one of the things, uh, what is, I'm not going to talk about lots of things which already has been talked everywhere. But uh, what is holding back Obama? from uh, achieving the results which he should have been achieving. A problem with problem is not the, are not the issues. Problem we have is uh, agreeing to what to do. Our Congress doesn't work and our uh, government doesn't work. I think uh, now Please uh, don't judge me right now on this particular statement. Obama is not a black American. As we understand black American, he's an he's a African or lady, lady. He's an he's a, he's a, he's a African or American, and uh, there is a difference. And difference is there. The new immigrants from Africa, like any other immigrants, they do not think that uh, they don't have, they have a different value and they think they have better values. And uh, they look down upon the people. Obama, whatever he talked in 2008 campaign about getting along red and blue, black and white, he hasn't done that. He, he doesn't have, he don't have a good relation with the black caucus. He doesn't have good relation with the black leaders. He doesn't have good relation with the black community. He doesn't have good relations with anybody. Even democratic senators and democratic congressmen, he doesn't have good relationship. He doesn't believe in talking to people, and when he talks, he talks down to them and not talk with them. He doesn't have good relations with European leaders. Now that is not the way to run government. No matter what, whatever you, may, your, your, my, you might be about a position on issues, if you cannot talk, if you cannot respect other people, you are not going to accomplish anything. And. Uh, where this thing comes from, okay? Second thing we normally not talk about, I'm going to talk about church. Okay, I think uh, Trinity Church and uh, Mormon Church, they both have made important contribution. These both churches uh, came in existence due to community who are harassed and uh, downgrade, what do you call it, insulted or uh, not treated properly. Trinity, Trinity Church uh, came to empower black people, an admirable goal. But what they did is that they demonized the majority community. And uh, Mormon Church, they had the same problem. They were demonized, they were kicked out. But what they did is that they, they tried to improve themselves to be respectable, to succeed, and uh, uh, to make their place in the United States. With the, among the their Mormon community is one of the most respected community. They work hard. They they, have a, they live clean life, and uh, they believe in American values. Unfortunately, Obama, Trinity, Trinity Church, what he got, those are not the values that we need. And that, those are not the values with which we can govern America. You cannot, you cannot govern America by hating people. No matter how bad are you, white people are still, they have, they have achieved this country 
where we are today. White people have paid lots of prices during their westward movement, and to castigate them is all bad, that is sad. You cannot build America on that basis, okay? You still, why so many white men who are voting against Obama? Because you cannot do that. Those, those people who run this country, who run our economy, and you, you just throw them down the drain? You tell them those are bad people? Doesn't work that way. It may feel good, but it is not going to make this economy work, no matter what is your program. Uh, let me indicate what, what I admire about Romney. Okay, what he believes in. Okay, Romney, Romney believes that knowledge, he has the knowledge of the issues in there which was shown in the first debate. He presented a good answers and systematic answers to questions presented to him. Obama did not. Obama instead belittled him and belittled programs. Commitment to issues. Romney brings his commitment, whatever issue he believes in, he brings commitment to that, and that is the way he succeeds. He's a result orientation. He looks at what results he wants to achieve. Obama doesn't look like that. Healthcare program is a healthcare program. It term prevents are running very nice. So we are doing lots of subpar programs. We cannot find a good solution. Healthcare program. It's a, it's a healthcare program. It doesn't save the cost. It doesn't save us any money. And, and, and uh, those kind of things are not very good. We got out of Iraq, but then we lost Iraq. We are getting out of Afghanistan, and we are going to lose, lose Afghanistan. And uh, Romney, as a re, his, Romney's psychology, his operating mechanism, is to achieve the results achieved quality results. And that is what we need. That is what works in a business. If you do not work in a business with a quality results, you get thrown out right now. China's progress is there. China achieves what the world wants. That's why China manufactures. Okay? The, the, we have to have problem solving approach. There is a problem, there is a solve. We have to solve that. Let me, let me explain you. When Ram, Ramni had to so all is a healthcare problem in Massachusetts. One day, and, and Democrats were majority. What he did is there one day go to Democratic majority leader and uh, go to his home. And he said, what, what can I do for you? He said, I need your help. <coughs> See, Barack Obama doesn't do that. And that is not the way America is going to work. That is not the way I'm going to solve our problem. We are going to solve our problem. He demonized Republicans. He should not have demonized Republicans. He said, come on, talk. Let's talk. Come on down to the White House. He can have all the party and invite, invite all the leaders and say, hey, let's, let's work together. He doesn't do that. Problem is not, not the issue. The problem is One how minute. Obama operates. And if he doesn't operate right way, then we are not going to solve our problem. To elect this guy again, to operate the same way, it is not going to work. Okay, let me tell you one other thing. Lots of things are thrown about Ramani as a murderer and everything. Ramani has operated, according to industry stand and everybody, those who criticize his main capitals and those are not within industry, they are saying that he has operated within the law. 30 seconds. All I can, all we can ask for any American citizen is that, to abide by the law of the United States. Charity is a different story. Ramni gives 10% of his income to charity. Okay? And that is the way, that is the way we want our people, and uh, that is what we want to be treated, we want others to be treated. Thank you. Mr. Barnes, if you're ready to go rebut. Barnes, Brennan. Brennan. Brennan, Mr. Brennan, I'm sorry. That's all right. That's it. My uh, apologies to the audience again. All right, 10 minutes for rebut and start. Oops. Uh, you know, I agree that every president ought to work with whoever he can work with. And I think President Obama has tried to work with Congress 
one of the leaders of Congress said his top priority was for President Obama to be a one-term president. Yeah. Right. It's pretty hard to work with a person whose top priority is to defeat you. Uh, th this is very difficult, and especially the idea that, that somehow President, uh, President Obama does not like white people or does not appreciate white people. Uh, why are so many white people uh, supporting him? I think because they know and I know, I, I certainly have talked with President Obama, and uh, very briefly, I never got any sense of hostility toward white people. I don't know if you have, uh, Mr. Patel, if you've had any direct contact with him. But I think it, it is important to work with people. But sometimes you don't get the cooperation you need. President Obama put together a jobs bill. It would, would have made 1.9 million new jobs according to Mark Zandi of Moody Analytical. But the Republican Senate would not vote for it. What kind of cooperation is that? What Republican Senate? The Republican Senate of the United States. The one one at a time, one. Bill. One uh, did not vote for, for Senator... O In fact, you know, they couldn't even get a majority vote because they were the filibuster. So, I think it's also good to consider um, what the scary part is about President Obama, I mean, I'm sorry, Mitt Romney's view on military spending. He wants to spend more. You remember D D Dwight Eisenhower, how he talk, t told us about you take a dollar out of the mouth of a baby or something like that and put it into arms? Right now, the United States Army is getting tanks it did not want. Isn't it time to reconsider things like that? Do you realize that my latest calculation is that if you took the military budget of the United States and divided it up equally among every man, woman, and child in the United States, it would be $2,200 per person. And the Chinese were the next biggest and far less, spend a lot less. How much do you think the average Chinese would spend on that same basis? $80. Now, are we 25 times more safe than the Chinese? Why do we have to spend so much money on military? The rest of the world doesn't feel that safe. Do you think that the Americans were that much hated, that we have to spend all that money? And again, let's get back to foreign policy. This is extremely important. Now, I, you know, I realize and I understand, Brad Little, how you can be disappointed in President Obama because uh, he is not Mahatma Gandhi by any means. But you're, we're comparing him with the other candidate that's likely to win, and that's Mitt Romney. And with Mitt Romney, after years, still did not understand that the United States decided to attack Iraq, even though there were United Nations inspectors there, and the International Atomic Energy Agency had inspectors there, and they were finding no weapons of mass destruction. Even then, President George Bush told the inspectors to get out if they wanted to be safe because he and Dick Cheney and their team had decided to attack Iraq anyway. Yes, we might say we lost Iraq. We would lose any country that would invade us, I, I, that we would invade, I think. And any country that would invade us, I think they would have to feel they lost us. I don't think Mitt Romney realizes that to put troops in another country doesn't make us less safe. It recruits terrorists and makes us more safe. More in danger, I'm sorry. That is the situation we have in the world. If we want safety, and, and then this whole idea of an apology tour that the fact checkers have found this liar, liar, pants, pants on fire, that supposedly President Obama's going around the world apologizing for us. Well, uh, Mitt Romney never apologized really directly, it took him days to say something like an apology for writing off 47% of the American people as not responsible. He doesn't believe in apologies, or at least they come pretty late. His first reaction to that was to say, well, that was not an elegant statement, was it? Well, that's, we can't, we need someone like President Obama. In fact, a poll of 21 countries in the world, uh, Obama is favored by a huge majority over Romney. What if, so, Something President Obama is saying or doing 
sounds like he must be doing the right thing. The one country where Mitt Romney got in the majority was Pakistan. And I don't know that I want to try to explain that, but uh, it just makes me wonder what's going on here. This is a man with no foreign, it's worse than having no foreign experience. I wonder, is he listening to advisors of George W. Bush? Where does he get his ignorance? It's dangerous, it's deadly to have a man like that having his finger on the, on the, on the weapon, the nuclear weapons, if he doesn't even understand Saddam Hussein. And even recently, you remember this sta statement where he was accusing President Romney, I'm sorry, President Obama, <laughs> President Obama of uh, criticizing him because of something he said before they attacked in Lib Libya. He doesn't, he didn't even get the facts straight. He thought that, that the attack had already taken place when, when President Obama said what he said. And that it was just the opposite. President Obama was talking about the, the situation with the Muslims before the attack on, on our embassy. But if he can't get this fact straight when he, when he makes a statement like that, what other facts would he not get straight? Do we want to trust this man to be our commander in chief? Have his finger on the nuclear trigger that could obliterate half the world? I mean, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with everything Obama does, but uh, he's, I think it's a lot more comfortable than having a rookie in there that might be listening to George W. Bush's advice or else making his mistakes like this on his own. Three minutes. Three minutes left. Is there anybody here who has a question they think that I haven't addressed? Well, 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 okay, can't ask If you're question. done, you're done. We'll get Mr. Uh, Patel okay, to go well, up. I've said the biggest thing, but I also want to say something else that's very important about the Affordable Care Act. Romney says get rid of it. Obama, that's his act. This act would mean 30 million more people would have insurance by the year 2021. Now that act is not the answer to our health plans. But when Obama's, Obama says, oh yeah, I'll put something else in, he doesn't have the power to put something else in. You wipe that out, what you do is you hasten the insolvency of the Medicare Trust Fund. The Medicare Hospital Trust Fund is estimated to expire in the year 2024. If Romney gets his way and gets rid of that, Obamacare, the Medicare Hospital Trust Fund will have the same problem it would have in 2024, that is not paying more than 87% of its bills. That will move up to the year 2016. That's a weakening of an essential, basic American program. Did, did Romney think of that? Or did he think of the seniors that are counting on their terribly expensive prescription drugs being helped by the Affordable Care Act? Or about the Tell prescription of, oh, thank you. Or or the, the pre prohibition in that act against discrimination against people based on their age or against women. Uh, those are some of the features of the Affordable Care Act that are important. They're not the whole answer. But Romney's going to toss out the baby with the bathwater. That is one example. You know, you know, and if you want to really trust our health care to a man who thinks that people, 47 percent of Americans, are I uh, think a government is sort of like their entitlement and that you know they should be more responsible. Do you think he's going to keep those programs that he's talking about? Think he's going to really make Medicare better? Why, if he's so concerned about our taxes, why would he be getting rid of the estate tax, which applies to people making over $5 million for an individual or $10 million for a family? Can he think of a better way to deal with our tax situation? Okay, one minute left. Uh, is, do you think oh, President Obama, uh, Mitt Romney, is a fair man? Where are all these, how is he going to, why, why should the rich end up, even if he said everything he was going to say, why should the rich end up with the same tax burden they have now? I've seen a poll of wealthy people, and 62% of people with incomes over $250,000 say they support paying more taxes to address the deficit. That's 62%. So who is Mitt Romney representing? He's not representing those 62%. He's so, so scared that the rich are going to pay more, more money. So these are just other considerations. And please, take your concerns to the friends you have in the battleground states. We need to spread the word. People don't realize this. They hear the 12 million tax figure, all of those 12 million jobs. They don't hear the rebuttals. Please, if you want data on that, let me, let me know. Thank you.
Ah. <laughs> Ten minutes. Namni walked on a water and parted the sea during 2008 election. And now he says he cannot do that. Leadership is not to say to people, you want to follow you. I'm your leader and now you're going to follow me. That's a Soviet Union style. That's an authoritarian style. It doesn't work like that in America. We have a freedom. Here, leadership has to be on. And if you cannot own a leadership, then you are not a leader. It's as simple as that. You know, we cannot force people to follow us. You know, we cannot expect people to follow us. Okay, we got to give them a reason to follow us. The, the idea, the, I don't know how this concept that a Republican, you know, so try to obstruct him. That's why we have two parties. We, have, we created an adversary system from the very beginning to stop other guy from going, going to haywire. That is what system we created deliberately. We created our court system deliberately like that. It wasn't that automatically, hey, I'm, I'm the guy and you know, come on, you're going to follow me. George Washington did not say like that. Abraham Lincoln did not say like that. He earned his leadership. Okay, where do we get this idea? As far as Texas and his concern, I hope that I, the, if you take away all the money for top 400 people have, all their assets and income, it's a 1.7 trillion dollars. It's a one, about one and a half years deficit. It is not going to solve our problem. Passing, passing rich people, who is going to give you a job? Where are jobs? Who creates jobs? Who creates jobs in this country? Customers. Government creates jobs? And but everybody every, everybody is going to get a job with a government? Okay, well, good luck to you. Line it up. You know what government, what about Obama is waiting for? Okay? The, the, there are 23 million people want jobs. What Obama is waiting for, guys? Go to Give him a job. Why he's not giving? Go ask him. Do you know who creates job? Job creates a guy like me and a guy like other business people. Okay? Now, if you, if, if you want to screw around with us and if you don't hate us, okay, it doesn't give us lots of incentive to get up early in the morning and go into work and hire somebody. Okay? It doesn't, America wasn't created that way. Okay? Let me tell you about something about medical, Medicare and all that scare thing you are going to throw away people. It is not in our it is not in our character. If you do not trust American character, then we do not throw away sick people. Sometimes it is harder to get help, that is true. Sometimes we do not get as good a carriage we want, that is true. Rich gets a better, better everything. Sure, we understood that from the very beginning. Okay, George Washington did not have the same problem as ordinary laborer who, who was working on a government district. <coughs> that is true. We have to work our way. We have to earn our living. We have to earn our riches. Dollars are not just thrown away, not given away. The idea that the Democratic Party is coming out with, that I'm entitled to. That's crazy. No country in the world believes that thing. Even China gave up that system. China was doing that that everybody entitled to. Finally, the Deng came and he said, hey, no, we got to follow American system. And do you know what happened? A miracle happened. 
in a China. Last 50 years, Chinese income increased by 40 times. You know how they did it? They did our way. They empowered the people to do businesses. And do you know what is hobbling us? Regulations. I get, I, I get a shipment from China. It has a one piece of paper stuck to the package. When I want to send $25 item to foreign country, they ask, they ask me to bunch of questions, I have to fill it out. To do it, where it's made, how much it weighs, you know, who made it, you know, come on. And, and, I, and it costs, I have to print 10 papers to see a $25 item. China does one paper. There is something wrong with our system. You know, our post office, Chinese post office, Chinese state post office, gives a low price to save overseas. We don't do that. There are two million business people on eBay and other places who can export. You know what is stopping their export? Our very high postage rate to overseas. Our too many requirement. See, we cannot grow by what 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 do they want all this information for? We have so much information in the CIA that they cannot do their job. I mean, Benghazi would not have happened. If all the, all the information they have have. 9-11 would not have happened. If all the information they have, they can manage it. We cannot manage information we have. And what do we want more information for? There, we have to operate intelligently. We have to operate to produce results. If we do not do that, then we have no hope. If you start bossing a rich people, if you pass a, if you boss people who create jobs, then jobs are not going to get created. Lots of rich people do not need their businesses. They do not need their factories. Okay. We if we, we do not like to export job to China. Hey, make a law prohibit it. Democrats had a complete majority. They could have said that, hey, you cannot ship job to China. You cannot take your plant there. You cannot, you cannot import from China. Three minutes. Okay? You can do whatever you like. You, you had a majority. Why didn't they, why did Obama did it? Why didn't he do it? It is it is how is that is cheap. You can talk all you want. Unfortunately, talks doesn't produce results. It, it takes brain. It takes lots of hard work. It takes guts. Okay? As far as leadership is concerned, that we have, we have a, lots of articles on leadership in our army. Okay? Leader has to show their guts. Leader has to go and a, leader has to go to a people he wants to lead, you know, show them that he is he's a worthy of a worthy leader. Okay? They can trust him to produce results. In a military, when you are captain, if his, his people trust him that this guy will take risk himself, he'll risk his life, then they will lead. But if he's not scared, he's trying to protect himself, you know, he's trying to have other, trying to feel good, look good, okay? They're not going to help, they're not going to fight for him. They're not going to fight him, it will be a disaster. There is a... We, Ramani is a warmonger, that is the most ridiculous statement I ever heard. There is nothing in his character, Nothing his, his, his life history that suggests that, and he never says that. But he did say that. We have to have a strong army so that we never have to have war. One minute. And Ramani is a well-balanced, he's a well-educated, he's a methodical in producing results. He's willing to go and talk to anybody. He's willing to negotiate with anybody to produce results, to solve problem for America. He does that for his church. 
Cambridge in Massachusetts. That's how he ran his bail, bail, bail company. And that he killed somebody. What kind of character that will accuse somebody, that he killed somebody, and the president will not ask his attorney general, they're going to prosecute him. In Obama White House, create an advertisement accusing Romney E. Kale. Time is up. Okay, thank you. All right. Now we will entertain questions from the audience, and it's going to be moderated by Brown. Let's give it up for Brown. State the uh, question, please be loud so we can get into the uh, recording. Let's uh, see the hands for the question. I see Peter and Doug and Don. And what about me? What about Gene? I know it's a little oh, dark in here. Keep <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. You'll be in real trouble. Okay. Oh, I'm so proud. So, all right. Who's got the first uh, question? Who raised their hands first? But I'm, yes, sir. I'm going to go around, starting with Sid. Okay, okay. watch it. This is uh, for you. Loud said. We have the Simpson bones. We're in the parts of uh, Social Security, we, uh, and during the Obama administration, uh, he wanted to cut back on Social Security, but at the same time, the Republicans didn't want to go along with him because they didn't think the cut was uh, big enough. What's your question? Thank you. I'm glad you brought up Social Security. Uh, President Obama's on record as opposing any cuts to Social Security. President, I'm sorry, Mitt Romney is on record as saying he wants to raise the retirement age of Social Security. President Obama is on record as saying he, we should consider that the people that now pay Social Security tax don't have to pay any Social Security tax after about $110,000. And if we ra raise that level, you would substantially strengthen Social Security. In fact, I've looked at an actuary report that says that if we took that cap off and let people pay their Social Security tax on all the money they make, we would keep the system going till the year 2080 and beyond. And that's what President Obama is open to and which, which Mitt Romney opposes. Romney's position is that that he will do whatever it has to be done to fix it. Money doesn't fall from the sky, and we have to live within our means. Okay, next. All right. Uh, here. Okay. Yes, a lot of people say that uh, Obamacare was modeled on Massachusetts Romney Care. Is that true? <coughs> I've heard it is. Uh, interesting, though, th th before you give too much credit to Romney, uh, he also tried to take away, they were going to put dental and vision care into the bill and he, for poor people, and he vetoed it, but they overrode the veto. That's what I read. Well, if it's true, then it seems kind of confusing that Obama defenders are defending Obamacare, which is really Romney care, and Romney supporters are against Obamacare, which is really Romney care. So this seems kind of confusing. Uh, what what uh, Romney believes, I think, that changes uh, should be made at state level, where there can be more innovation can be incorporated to fit the needs of individual states. Because uh, some states have a different needs and different political atmosphere and uh, different dynamics, you know. Interesting that you brought that up because in the Obamacare, there's an increased Medicare tax on higher incomes. And the Republicans, several of them, maybe 200 of them, have taken the no tax uh, pledge to Grover Norquist, remember a president of the Americans for Tax Reform, the man who wants government to be so small it would fit into a bathtub or it could be strangled. They've got a pledge on to that, to that man. 
And so that's probably why some of the Republicans don't like Obamacare, because they, some of the wealthier ones would have to pay more taxes to support, to strengthen Medicare. Okay. Uh, Gene, Gene, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Patel. Mr. Patel, oh. Mr. Patel said that uh, we are losing Iraq. We are losing Afghanistan. I'm asking Mr. Patel, what are we losing? Uh, uh, what what we are losing in Iraq is that uh, Al Qaeda is on a rise, and uh, the Iran is sending uh, armament over Iraqi airspace to Syria, Syrian government. That's that. Where we are losing is in Afghanistan is also Al Qaeda is on a rise there. And uh, we, when we, we are announced we are living on a 2014, and the, we are going to have a problem. But Romney and Obama have basically the same positions, okay? I agree with Mr. Patel that, that they are pretty close, but we are losing partly because that when we have our plane circling overhead and decide to, to bomb a wedding party in Afghanistan and kill 200 people, uh, that loses people in Afghanistan and things that we've done in Iraq and not to mention the attack, just, we lose. Just a minute, I didn't when asking whether we lose the war, I interpret Mr. Patel saying because of the action of President Obama, oh. we losing oh. Iraq. We losing Afghanistan. If he didn't mean it that way, let him tell me he didn't mean it that way and that he was talking what? about the war. I'm not talking about war, because it was never war in the first place. What I mean was that those countries are getting away from being closer to us. They are, they are slowly drifting away. That's what I mean. The question is, why are they drifting away? Uh, is it not surprising that when we militarily occupy a country, even in a friendly country like Japan, there's rapes by American soldiers, and you wonder, well, you know, how much worse it must it be in a country like Iraq or Afghanistan when we have so many troops in there and so many people are are hostile, and people, an increasing number of people say it's okay in Afghanistan to kill Americans. And why is that? Why, we, it, first of all, it's not ours to lose. Um, I would like to ask both of you, um, for example, Romney is a Mormon, and the Mormon church has some very odd beliefs about magic underwear and Every, when every man dies, he's going to have his own planet and a bunch of things like that, which may or may not concern me as much as how will the religious beliefs of Mr. Romney affect how he governs and um, why isn't anyone asking that question, not only of him, but of any other um, candidate who professes a particular religion. Yeah. I really, that's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about whether the Mormonism would affect any of his beliefs. I, I don't know of any effect on his beliefs. I, I think John Kennedy answered that question already in 1960. This is not talking about John Kennedy, we're talking about Ron. Well, that's not all right. Same thing. Same thing. No, but they're two different shares. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
up there said 12 million jobs, or uh, Romney, I think, is quoted at as high as 16 million. And the thing I don't understand now, Romney is against uh, government investment in the labor force. So uh, I imagine that he would not be looking to uh, support infrastructure building to increase the labor force. It sounds like all those people would have to come through the private sector. But I have yet to hear how exactly are 16 million people going to find work uh, if Romney's elected? So, can you answer, uh, solve that equation? I can, I, I can give you my plan how we'll do it. <laughs> President Raj. Hundred million people in this country makes less than $25,000 a year. Obama created jobs, it cost $275,000 per job. It cost $275,000 to government to create one job. Okay? You figure it out the math, how it will work. Romney will create a Romney is saying is that, that lots of, what, what lots of businessmen are saying to him. He say, businessmen are saying is that, that empower them, what I talk about regulation, okay, streamline the regulation, you know, and then jobs will be created. Because Obama do not, doesn't have a plan how to create a job except government spending. Okay? If you are going to spend, and I told you, if you want to get a job from government, go ahead. But ultimately, business people have to create a job. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well done. No, I never asked the question. Okay, good. Go ahead. Well done. Okay. All right. I don't really need the mic. I'm after you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I just my question is for Raj. Um, who'd you vote for for president in 08? I didn't vote. You didn't vote. <laughs> what, what's wrong with you? Are, are you an, are you not a citizen or something? No, I'm sitting down. Okay. Well. Okay. So what's your okay? So what's your excuse for voting? I I I I I I thought two hours. I sat down in my sofa. Waited two hours thinking about whom to vote. I could not vote for Obama because I, 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 I wasn't one of the faithful, like lots of you guys were. You know? And I didn't want to vote for McCain because I don't think that uh, he'll make a president that I can support. Then why not do the Green Party or some third party candidate? No, 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 that, that, that's not my style. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks for a good debate, and this question is for uh, both of you. Uh, the C word in this case, climate, was not even mentioned in any of the uh, television debates. At the Republican National Convention, we had Mitt Romney getting up and making fun and joking about any real concern about dealing with climate disruption. Then we had the delegates really yucking and whooping it up. Uh, what steps uh, should we be taking in the next four years to deal with the serious environmental problem because we are running out of time? Excellent question. I wish I knew the answer, but I think that we'll be closer to that with President Obama than we would with, with Mitt Romney, who was very much for big oil and who was wanted to cut the, the subsidy for the wind power, for example. So there's, I, I, that's a, a very important question and it should have been discussed a lot more. If you don't have money in a bank, you can do anything. Uh, uh, that's not the answer. You don't have money. That's not really an answer. But All right, Ron. I'm sorry. I got this. You don't have money. I'm late. I have money for war. If you don't have money, give us leave it alone. Okay. You got plenty of money for war. All right. Charles, you did. Yeah. Let's change places, sir. Uh, you talk in there that uh, if it costs so much for the government to create a job, now the CEOs say, oh, don't tax us, don't tax us, because we'll take our billions of dollars and we'll create jobs for you. Right. Well, how much do those jobs cost as opposed to taxing them the way we are taxed? How much do those jobs cost? And are we even going to get any jobs? 
Because it looks like they don't create jobs except in China. Right. <laughs> they don't use that money to keep jobs. How much does a C CEO, where, do you, where, where does it mean they create jobs? Where did you come up with that? Maybe jobs for guys who may build yachts. <laughs> <laughs> to put in elevators in garage. One food but Charlie, the yacht, the, yacht, the yacht industry is undergoing a boom. Yeah. It's creating jobs. <laughs> Every oh, rising tide loops all yachts. All right. Only way jobs are going to get created is if business expands, businesses start building factories, there are new businesses, and there are innovations. And what government should do is, government should not create a job, but government should get out of the way and encourage. China, that's what China does. Chinese government, if business can create a job, they get out of it, out of their way. You know, we have to, there is no way, you know, we have been doing, we have been, all of, most people, last majority of the people, 100, 120 million people work in a private sector. And all those are private businesses. And that has to be expanded. They, we, I, I, have to have a, I have to have a confidence to invest more. Then, government is responsible. Government budget is balanced. Government spending money wisely. Government talks some sense. If I don't have a confidence in, in, in a government, we got a big problem. So you want Chinese style factories here in the United States? No, it's not Chinese style factory, but what I'm saying is that we have 120,000, 120 million jobs, oh, and same same people are going to expand jobs. Okay, now let me tell you, the health healthcare, okay, this scares this scare the hell out of small small not talking about the Romney kind of big small company. But 25, 30, 30 people company scares the hell out of them. You know, it's a 30 company and a healthcare is a $250,000 per year more. Okay, now you are not making $250,000, where are you going to get it? Okay, that, that is a question. It's not you can ask all you want, but you, but you, you do not have pocket in the money and you calculate that you do, you're making two, you're making $100,000 profit and the government is asking you $250,000 spend more. How are you going to do that? I, I agree with you about the importance of small businesses and uh, being competitive. It's interesting that they said at one time that a, a car in Detroit, a thousand dollars of the cost of the car would be for health insurance expenses. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but the point is, is if we covered everybody with Medicare, uh, then the small businesses wouldn't have that burden of having to take on the, the all the, you know b b paying for the United Healthcare Chief's five million dollar severance pay for his retirement. So I think partly it's a combination of public private partnership, and it, I think the, the, the Democratic presidents must have something right on this because remember Bill Clinton at the convention he's talked about this and has been double checked by two fact checkers and here's what they found that since J F Kennedy that the record of Democrats and Republican presidents as far as creation of jobs, that the Democrat under Democratic presidents, there were 42 million jobs created in the private sector. And under the Republican presidents, there's 24 million jobs created. That's an 18 million job difference, a 75% difference. That doesn't mean that, that the Republicans are always wrong and the Democrats are always right. It just means that, that you know, we, let's consider what Obama was trying to do. One of the things he was trying to do was to make it easier for small, you know, but with the tax cuts for small businesses, he did put in tax cuts that should have helped small businesses and did help them. I don't know if it was enough, and I agree with you. We may we need to do more, but that's in, going in the right direction because it, it, we have to build our roads, we have to pay our teachers, we have to keep keep the the, the road the, the, the road the bridges from crumbling. That's public expenditure. So it's not just private; it's not just public. All right. Uh... Uh, the, one second, okay. okay. During uh, health care, there were ways to minimize health to focus, there were ways to focus on a cost. Obama chose not to. 
there was there was a way to create a bipartisan health care. Obama chose not to, and and Nancy Pelosi chose not to. Okay, there were there were ways we can create. Like I agree with you, Michael. Okay, that we can. I mean, they, oh, if they had the votes, they could have created national health care. That would have been fine. But they didn't create that. They say, okay, five percent tax on everybody. That's social security, and everybody gets health care. That's what it is, right? I mean, uh, you want to get everybody, everybody health care, you can say you pay five percent and your health, you are covered. If they could have done that, and I would have agreed. But they did not do that. They mess around with 2,500 pages. You know, if I want my right according to the Obama care, and I'm denied, I got to go to court. I don't have no, I cannot, I, I have no way. I got to go to court. By that time, I'll be dead. <sighs> All right, Michael Foley. <laughs> I got a question for Mr. Brennan. Right now, President Obama is the commander in chief, and he's in charge of wars in at least 14 foreign countries in Africa and Asia. And he himself started wars in four separate African countries, either late last year or early this year. How can you say he's not going to start any more wars when he's one of the biggest war mongers in history? No, no, no. That's a good question. I certainly, as I say, he's not Mahatma Gandhi, that's for sure. And I, I think, how would we feel if we're drones circling around in our skies that some foreign president would decide could shoot down and shoot down an American or someone in our country or in the next block? We wouldn't like that either. And I agree with you that, you know, I'm not saying Obama is, is what I want compared to, you know, what we should have. I'm just saying that he's better than Mitt Romney. That's all I'm saying. Obama likes to play with his Blackberry and he thinks it's, you know, it's a nice to play around with drones from Los Angeles, from Washington, D.C. I, I do not know. I do not agree with the drone program. All right. Uh, um, I'd like you guys to comment on the following statement. Do you think that we're in for more of the tax cut uh, spend tax cut to riches scam that the Republicans are going to be doing, or the uh, promised government to everybody increase deficit that the re Democrats are. And if you can clarify that statement, uh, I would much appreciate it. Uh, I think uh, when a tax cut, Romney's position is very clear. He wants, uh, he wants tax cut uh, in, a, in a tandem with uh, tax reform, simplifying the tax. And his position is that, that the total, total package should be deficit neutral. And he wants to simplify it. And I'm for simplifying because what happens is that right now, that those those people who cannot afford accountant, they end up paying what government mandates. And those who have accountant, they find a loopholes. We have lots of loopholes. And in simplifying the tax system, we can afford to reduce it on everybody. And I think middle class will benefit under Romney's system. Uh, they have done studies about who pays more under the tax cut code, and it looks like the millionaires get a lot bigger benefit, and some lower income are actually going to pay more, and their programs are going to be in, in danger because they're going to be trying to they're going to use the deficit as an excuse to cut things. So it's a very scary situation. It's important to keep in mind that there are at least 25 polls in this country in the last year or two that say that. Yes, tax higher incomes more. And I found even one poll, did I mention this to you? $250,000 or more, 62% said they're willing to pay more. So it's not the whole answer. Taxes are not the whole answer. But remember that under President Clinton, and Warren Buffett likes to remind us of this, that people paid high, higher incomes paid more and the country was more prosperous. Higher taxes do not guarantee prosperity, but if they're well spent, 
you know, making sure small businesses are encouraged and ed education is fostered and our crumbling roads are taken care of and all the other things that need to be done, then, then the taxes can be very valuable. I don't know if I've answered your question. No, it, it's, it's fine. Can I add one thing? Yeah. I think one of the proposals Ramli made is that uh, <laughs> that uh, limiting deductions as a, as a certain fixed amount, that makes lots of sense. That, 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 that means that if, if you are, let, let's, let's say, at $35,000 maximum deductions, those people owning a $10 million house, homes, they'll be paying a lot more taxes. See? And, and those people who are making, people owning smaller homes under half a million dollars, they will not pay so much taxes. So that will be automatic be higher tax on rich people. Mansion. Uh, oh, wow. I feel bad about that. Oh, oh, oh. All right, sorry. Bob? <laughs> All right, let him have a mic. As most of you uh, probably know, I'm very much a friend of the Constitution, which means I'm in favor of honoring the principle of federalism. Uh, this, the United States Constitution doesn't authorize the federal government to be involved in this stuff. The states, however, have far more plenary power and tax power than the federal government. Now, the federal government apparently is able to throw money at problems. If it wants a highway built between Omaha and Point X, it says to the states involved, we'll pay 90% of the bill as long as the highway is X feet wide or whatever, you know, a little technical details, and it follows this route. In fact, the federal government has not really any choice in this matter because they don't have the power of eminent domain to build a highway. Um, so I suggest that what should be done is the federal government should get out of the way and just in a sense reinsure the state plans. Now just as they can require a highway that's eligible for 90% payments to have a certain configurations or whatever, they could say, we're only going to reinsure plans that have no limitation on previous uh, conditions. What's your question? Do you want every state to have their own foreign policy? They, they, no, the federal government, the Constitution says only the federal government has that power. I said I'm in favor of holding the federal question. Constitution. This is a good rebuttal, but we okay. need the federal government has okay. a okay. The question is, why do you That's oppose right. federalism? So that's not mine. Who opposes federalism? Yours. Oh, oh. not mine. Yeah, not mine. Federalism is respecting the states. I believe in the Constitution. I support federalism. Well, then why are you advocating these plans? These plans, uh, the Constitution does not forbid uh, dealing with health care. No. Show me the power of Congress in this respect. Uh, well, I don't have my constitution with me, so I can't very well. Oh, you've got yours with you. Okay, well, let me look at it for a minute while. Well, hang on. This is talking about something that isn't in the constitution. That's the point. There's no jurisdiction for this. There's no restriction. There's nothing that says that only the, the states can deal with these things. You want to look at this? Next question. Next question. Yeah, this is okay. All right, next question, Brom. We're not allowed to we have president. another question. Uh, so we got more. Come on, you guys got better than this. You got more yeah, questions. I got one. I got another question. Another one. So do I. All right. All right, Brom. All right. All right. Yeah. Oh, me? Go ahead. No, Gene. Oh, Gene, go ahead. Okay, Gene. Now, oh, Gene. Yeah. Oh, I got one. Oh, I'm ready. Okay, Charlie. Go ahead. Uh, I, can, anyway, Charles, I can the next one. Charles, the, uh, uh, okay, my question. Well, first of all, I guess it's more for Raj, but y'all both can answer it. Um, the uh, and uh, Raj, you mentioned Louder. before that we all have to um, we all have to earn our living. I mean, now, what about what about people who inherit their wealth and have you know they got enough money from they got it. What about people who look, Raj? You you said that we all need to earn our living. So what I'd like to know is, is well, how do you feel about people who have how, have inherited their wealth from their parents and and who therefore have enough money that they don't they don't need to work? What do you think about that? Oh, sure. And and 
Mr. Brennan can comment afterwards if he wants. But. I'm, I'm not running for president, and I don't have no position on this. <laughs> 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 yeah. like, said we all need to earn our living. Thanks, Tim. Are you, are you asking what? I repeat the question about. Okay, well, I'm just. Raj said in his lecture that we all have to earn our living, and I'm just asking, well, what about people who have inherited their wealth from their parents? I mean, they don't. They don't. Thank you, ma'am. They don't need to earn a living because they got enough money from they got enough money from investments, etc., and inheritance that they can just they can just relax. Yeah, like but do they, is there a moral imperative to earn a living? Uh, I wouldn't want to try to tell anybody how they're supposed dollars. to live their life, but I would say that, you know, there's where a, an example of where tax reform would help, that if people are getting their money from investments, uh, shouldn't they pay the same rate as people that are out there working? Uh, okay. Charles? Yeah. Uh, Raj, you said uh, President Obama was lacking in interpersonal skills. Mm -hmm. However, Yesterday I got an article from In These Times magazine that President Romney He's has a nine point four, or not President Romney, but <laughs> Romney, if became president, has a nine point plan to abolish labor unions. Yay! And get rid of all the labor organizers. Yeah! And yeah. do you think if he's elected, he's going to invite me to the White House to come meet him? He'll, he'll bring you to the White House in chains, Charlie. No, he, he, Charlie, it'll be, it'll be because of the picket line Charlie puts in front. Such a nice guy, you know. Charlie, you'll be welcome as a citizen of the United States. Uh, We're going to have to okay. leave the country. Now, has Obama invited you as a new member? Is Obama, I mean, Obama calls you and he doesn't yeah. call me. And you want me to answer it? Yeah. Seriously, Obama made a point of going to each and every one of the federal agencies within the past year or two. I yes. Know, but, but yeah, he went to each and every but, one. But agency, I'm in the executive office, so it doesn't like he's I mean, gotta, I mean, I mean, I'm serious. Obama, Obama doesn't, answer, doesn't answer my questions, my letters, or my emails, okay? So I'm sorry, I mean, he doesn't answer. So you're lucky if you get the answer from them, you know? So I do not know what labor union he, he's going to do or not going to do. I think in a, it, you... Let me put it this way. Yeah. These CEO types are ruthless. And to tell me that this guy is like Mr. Rogers, he would have said in speeches that we're going to be put on a rocket ship and shot to the moon. Wait, do you know, okay. Don't tell me that some guy's going to be real nice okay, to us. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. who's, who's come to Seoul, I will tell that I think <laughs> Government unions, I have a problem with when they go overboard. Because union, labor should have a right, but everybody should have a right. Labor unions are not fighting for all the workers. They are fighting for privileged positions. They are fighting to get more privilege for their particular group and not for all the workers of the United States. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, everybody doing his own thing. You know, I, I mean, you want more money, and you want to squeeze more money from your boss or whatever, fine. You know, you're not fighting for every every single worker. You know, actually, you make, you make more money as a government worker, then I have to pay more tax. You know, every single employee, all, all other non-government employee, you squeeze them, okay? You're not doing them favor, okay? I mean, you want, you want, you squeeze all the you can, milk you can get from the poor, you know, the worker making $20,000, $25,000, you say, hey, pay taxes, you know, I got to pay, I want money more, I want $100,000, you know, you pay. I want benefit. I want retirement, you know, lasting forever, okay? You, you don't have, I don't care. Okay? I mean, so what? You're fighting for yourself, fight for yourself, sir. An injury to one is an injury to all. That's the principle of a union. And the fact that we've had unions for the years has meant that many people in this country even if they weren't members of unions, have a better life. They have better working conditions, they have better hours. Uh, the unions 
are one of our prized assets in this country, and we should be very happy that they are working to keep their workers at a decent wage. And if you look at what people are actually being paid, uh, you'll see it isn't, the, the union aren't, people aren't the people like the guy I was telling you about that's getting $5 million every year for retirement. That's not a union man. That's somebody else. That's a private entrepreneur. So, anyway, that's... If you take Sweden, Sweden has about 85% of its workers that are in unions. That's why they got all the social benefits. So if you look at the United States, it's maybe about 8 to 10% that are in unions. That's why the average person now is making $10 an hour, and that's not a living wage. If you have Romney in there, he'll be making $5. <laughs> 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 I think no, no president of the United States, the most powerful one, most charismatic one, even had a 10 cents worth of power to do those things. I'm sorry. Okay? What you are saying, if no president can do that, what you are telling me. And if you want to have 85% in a union, hey, I agree with that. You know, organize them. You know, I'm not against that. 85% is better than 10%. Uh, it would be interesting to know why the unions are supporting President Obama and not Mitt Romney. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, there must be a reason for that, right? The AFL-CIO president wasn't too happy at Democratic Convention. He said, we are going to support Obama, you know, but I mean, he was kind of, you know, it wasn't like a George Winnie walking in with a Hubert Humphrey in a Chicago hotel. It didn't look, it was a triumphal thing, okay? It was kind of a low key, he was nowhere to be found, you know, you know, kind of. And when, when, in, a, when in a Wisconsin, Union wanted Obama to come and speak, Obama was nowhere to be found. He was, he was kind of guarding his flanks. Union have a, Union, Union still have a little better chance with Obama. You know, it's a, it's a special interest, right? Obama is not a big guy for union, okay. but he's okay. All right, we're here. Uh, Gene, uh, Yeah, uh, it sounds like you lack so many other people, and maybe so many other people that make me think it's coming from you too. Two and two is four, but you imply two and two is five. Now you say that you don't want your money going to these people that go to the government and say, I need 10 more dollars to make my earnings $15 an hour because you have to pay taxes. But now when that same government give people hundreds of millions of dollars, who and where that money come from? Is that not your taxes? And if it is, does that bother you or does the union guy bother you? So all taxes bothers me. That's why Romney wants to reduce them. Romney wants to reduce them for the wealthiest people. Uh, the rest of us, I, it's hard to say because he has not said anything about the specifics of all those exemptions. And if he doesn't say something, then, then that means the rest of the people that depend on public programs are going to get hurt. Well, that's Jill Motors. Uh, uh, Romney said that the middle class, middle class taxes will not go up. He has said explicitly. Okay, next. Uh, Mo Sheffield. Thank you. Wait, wait for the mic, Mo. Uh, Paul, the mic. Raj, bring the mic over to here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just want to make, uh, well, here. Henry Ford said in 1913 that he shocked the leaders of American industry that he was raising uh, the uh, auto effective demand. Effective demand means not that, oh, I want that. It means I want that and here's the money for it. Um, Keynes, during the Depression, which we got a, a moderate rate, said 
it, it would be better to just fly airplanes over the country dropping uh, dollar bills or ten dollar bills or whatever he suggests. Essentially, what industry is doing now is turning its back on the American market and turning toward the foreign market. That's why they, that's why they want to depress the middle class. So what's your question? So the question is, don't you think all of that is true? <laughs> Well, what is happening is that most Americans do not seem to realize that uh, we had a privileged situation for, for about 40, 50 years after uh, World War II. Now, China has a bigger middle class and a bigger market for companies than they can have in America. That's a reality. Now, if you had China and India together, their middle class, okay, um, and at Brazil and, and at other developing countries, and their market is getting bigger, and that market is expected to grow much faster. So, so companies make calculation. Walmarts are in China, Walmart is in India, the, the McDonald's, and lots of companies open in North, in China. Starbucks, okay, they are expecting a big business there. And so we have to adjust. And it's going to impact us. Somebody's we have to change our ways. We, America, we have been very wasteful because we had a, we were the superpower, we had all the money, and now we have to serve with the rest of the world, and that's the reality, and it's not going to go away. Well, I don't think I can do justice to your whole question, but at least addressing what you're saying, I think the way, one way to do that is to invest in education in this country so that our people can compete. There'll be, you know, there are, there's a terrible waste of talent in this country. And let's, that is a, a great example of a public good, that instead of keeping it in the pockets of millionaires, uh, you remember what Warren Buffett once said? He said he, the people, he knows all these wealthy people, a lot of them. And he said he doesn't know any wealthy person who, who, when, who when confronted with, with an opportunity to do an adventure in capitalism, ever would say, oh, I'm not going to do that because my tax bracket's too high. One of the one of the important things happen is that and and there are lots of Chinese coming here in America lately, Chinese students, young people. At least uh, I see in my building. Okay. Okay. And uh, what is happening is that our educational system has failed us. We are not able to produce the quality of people to our needs. And uh, we need an educator. Two years back, I spoke on education and everything. And I told that uh, our universities are too expensive, they have a runaway cost. Lately, there have been lots of discussions on that, and some universities are ro rolling back, but they have to do that lot more. Okay. Bob Rosenstein. Rosenstein. Let's let's use the mic. And as I recall in his acceptance speech, uh, Mitt Romney derided uh, Barack Obama for caring more about the planet than about uh, people. But uh, let us ask the question whether you can really care about people without caring for the planet uh, to develop a green, sustainable economy with, based on renewable energy, and whether we can expect anything but uh, climate instability and passing climate tipping points if we are foolish enough to vote uh, Romney and his sidekick Paul Ryan in office. What can we expect uh, from Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney other than drilling for more oil or, or uh, coal? And uh, how can we expect to, to 
be the world leader leading towards a resurgence of the climate without re-electing Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Again, I'll go back to my speech back there. Dan, I, you cannot, you cannot artificially create a sustainable energy. Lots of science required to, for them to be competitive and to be on a large scale is not there. See, we do not. If, if they are profitable, lots of businesses will jump into that. But right now, we have so much energy in the United States, in our gas, and in a, a, a Canadian sand, and in Montana, and, and other places there, that we do not, we do not need a sustainable, it's not competitive. And to some extent we go on. I believe in a sustainable, but I believe that lots of research and has to be done before it will become universal. I think over the next 50 years, probably lots of research will take place. And after 50 years, uh, probably we'll be using more sustainable than the other. But right now, just discovering so much oil and so much gas all over the world, that is so cheap. Sustainable cannot complete. I agree with your concerns, Bob, and I would I would say that if we <clears throat> invest in making wind power, solar power, other countries are are developing these technologies. We can't just sit back and watch our you know our, our fracking go on and, and messing up our environment when we could be. You know, subsidizing wind power to help it get started, something that Mitt Romney opposes. Uh, we, this is, and, and Governor, I'm sorry, President Robert, Romney has supported, and we're making real progress in this. So it, it's, you know, we're all going to be better off for it if we don't wait till we're out of gas and out of oil. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the, oh, the, uh, one second, okay? Sorry. Yeah, use the mic. Go ahead. Go ahead. Nobody's stopping you. Go ahead. Okay. The, the, some of the European countries, they don't have any oil. Well, sir. And, 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 and gas, gas, and that. Okay, I'm sorry. Aim it at yourself. Aim the mic. Aim the mic. Okay. Okay. And, and, okay. And, and, uh, and, uh, in Europe, gas prices are at a gas station very high, eight, nine, ten dollars, and those taxes used to support other sustainable energy. Denmark and uh, Sweden and all those countries there, they they can afford solar power because relative cost is uh, comparable. But in America, we have a lots of gas, lots of energy. Okay. All right, Bill Ford, Henry Pence, Bill Ford. Okay. Mike Bennett, I got a really significant question for you. It's about Mr. Clinton. Now, he said a lot of things in the, at the convention about job creation. Uh, you believe him. Do you believe him? Uh, I mean, if you were a woman, he would love you. <laughs> he would really ask you questions. But do you really believe that he's telling the truth to the public? Has he? How often does he? Do you really have? Does any? Has anybody really figured out when? I mean, it, does is equal is or does it equal maybe not? I mean, do you really believe him? And that's my question. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to say Bill Clinton like I was quoting an authority. Oh. I was, I referenced it me because I thought it'd be familiar to people. The what I really wanted to point out was that two fact-checking organizations checked out his remarks about Republican and Democratic presidents creating jobs. And when the fact checker said yes, then I felt comfortable quoting him. 
But no, and I agree, I'm not taking Joe Clinton. He's not one of my authorities. Check it out yourself. Yeah, I did, with the fact checkers. I mean yourself. Oh, come on, ridiculous. Jim Bolger. Last question. Cubs are now in second place from the bottom of the National Football League. Would you support some kind of government in a government stimulus program to help them out to win the World Series? <laughs> no! <laughs> what a draft system for baseball. Let the best team win. Oh. Alright, wow. thanks. Uh, okay, well, two minutes. Well, thank you. That ends our question period. We're going to do the re okay. uh, rebuttal period. We want to hear oh. your views. And, uh, I want to see the hands of those who are going to share their views with the rest of us. Uh, and we'll have to count to see how much time we can allow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, twelve. All right, at least 12. <laughs> uh, Don, I have a slightly different calculation. Five minutes each. Okay. Uh, no more than five. Okay. Okay. Let's get them up again for our speakers tonight. All right. I, I got to admit, I do deserve the pain that suffered tonight. Uh, especially listen to Mr. Patel. Uh, why, why, do, why do somebody who know nothing about everything, nothing about anything, and nothing about nothing, uh, have the guts to come in front of a bunch of people and pretend? Uh, we, we have a very... Uh, difficult problem understanding, for example, the cost of energy is global. <coughs> Whether the country has oil or not, the cost that people pay for the gasoline is the same. In Canada they have a lot of oil, but they pay the same like we pay for the gasoline. And this is because it's a globalized uh, uh, commodity. So. It doesn't matter whether you have it or not. So this was a false argument where you, you are going to drill, drill, and you are going to be. The advantage for any country to have oil is that it helps their economy uh, doing the, uh, all the work that it needs to be done to get the oil and all that, have a lot of jobs. And so it produces an economic benefit to the country. But as far as to the cost, of the, of the fuels to the people, it doesn't matter. It's a global cost. Um, uh, I um, have to mention, if you, you must, uh, most of you have seen a movie that it was done many years ago. It's called They Leave. And uh, when I saw that movie a couple nights ago, I'd say we are leaving that movie. It's a science fiction movie, but the empathy of that movie was that people were in, uh, pushed to consume, and by means that they were, you know, under underground and all that. But they were consumed, consumed, consumed. And when we hear that. We want a job, you know, it's a fucking job that will exploit your energy, suck your energy, suck your life, and at the end speak you out like a piece of shit. And uh, then the wealth that you produce with your arms and so on is taken away from you to the clouds somewhere up there. And as we see, the people who own the corporations, who own the wealth, they want more of you. They want more. They want to take more blood out of you. And the more you give, the more they want. They don't want to educate you except to be an automat, to be punching 
punching numbers or some other bullshit like that. One minute, but thank. To, for you to think, they don't want that. They don't want you to think. They want you to give your energy to the system. This happens into the matrix. It was very clear how they show how the people were hooked to produce the electricity that the system needed to keep functioning. It was shown in this movie, They Live. It was shown in the movie, The Forbidden Education. This is a Latin American movie that says, forbidden education. That means that education is not what we think it is. Education is a tool they use to control us, to force us to think that we are getting something out of our job. And the only thing is we are getting <laughs> Next, five minutes. Oh, there's a line. How do I know? We have a 